You are listening to KLRN Radio, where liberty and reason still reign. Most writers and radio show hosts know that to connect with your fans, you need to do more than just write books or record the latest podcasts. There are many different elements that go into forming an online platform, but there are also many hidden traps. To make matters worse, solid advice on how to survive the muddy waters is scarce. In the book Hidden Traps, I talk about some of the important issues of working with an online platform, highlighting traps that could put your physical or internet security at risk, or be harmful to your reputation. Are your social media posts just links with a few disjointed words making you look like someone who can't complete a sentence? Did your new website cost you more than you anticipated? Are you leaking your personal contact details across the web without even knowing it? Then you need Hidden Traps. Hidden Traps is now available in paperback and ebook from a variety of retailers, including Amazon, Barnes & Noble, and Kobo. Visit blackwolfpublications.com for more details. Do you need a car? Been shopping only to be turned down because of bad credit, low credit, no credit, bankruptcy, or divorce? Guess what? Today's your lucky day. Because now you can buy a car, truck, or SUV, just about any vehicle. It's true. Bad credit doesn't matter. No credit doesn't matter. Bankruptcy or divorce, it just doesn't matter. As a matter of fact, your job is your ticket to your new vehicle. We're Auto Credit Express, and we've helped thousands of people just like you. Antonio H. told us, great company, got me connected, and the day I went in, I drove off in the car I wanted. 100% worth your time. Need a car? Get started now and drive off as early as today. Just text FINANCE, F-I-N-A-N-C-E, to 357 right now to get started. That's FINANCE, F-I-N-A-N-C-E, to 357 Auto financing the easy way. Text FINANCE to 357 KLRN Radio has advertising rates available. We have rates to fit almost any budget. Contact us at advertising at klrnradio.com. Everyone loves liberty. Our rights come from God, not the government. So why are you letting other people tell you what's best for your health care? Exercise your freedom with Liberty Health Share. Liberty Health Share is a community of people who voluntarily share one another's medical costs. Liberty Health Share is founded on the idea that most people truly want to help one another. Healthcare sharing allows members to do just that as a true community that supports one another in times of need. Liberty believes people should make decisions for themselves and their families. Members are able to take back the freedom to make their own decisions about their health care. Freedom from guilt or doubt about how your money is used. You have the freedom to direct your health care, not to be dictated to by bureaucrats. Stop letting others tell you what to do and join a community of like-minded people. Exercise your freedom. Join Liberty HealthShare and take back the control of your health care while helping those around you. Call Liberty at 855-58-LIBERTY. Again, that's 855-58-L-I-B-E-R-T-Y for more information. Or you can check them out at libertyhealthshare.org. Again, that's libertyhealthshare.org. My son was in the Army back during Desert Storm, but even then he wanted an MBA. He looked at a dozen schools, but only one offered the online education and flexibility he needed while he was in a tent in Iraq, Grantham University. Turns out that Grantham's been delivering affordable, relevant college and advanced degrees for over 65 years. Heck, if they can deliver a quality education to a soldier in a tent overseas, Think about the flexibility Grantham can offer you so you can earn your degree, too. It doesn't matter how complicated or full your life is. If getting a degree is on your bucket list, you'll want to do what my son did. You'll want to call Grantham. Find out how easy it is to get started on your education so you can check that college degree off your bucket list. Call Grantham right now. 800-910-1370. That's 800-910-1370. Flexible, affordable, relevant. Call 800-910-1370. At St. Jude, a family never sees a bill at all. It's like the world has been lifted off of your shoulders. St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. Sometimes riders feel lost, unsure why a passage may not be working. 
It takes another set of eyes to help us nurture our writing into full maturity. At Black Wolf Editorial Services, we strive to enable writers to develop and grow, offering manuscript critiques and line edits through a mentoring editorial style. We also offer assistance on generating a writer's bio for your websites. Black Wolf Editorial Services, nurturing your writing into maturity. For a full list of services, visit blackwolfeditorial.com. You're listening to the Spark Radio Network, internet radio like you've never heard before. Innovation, creativity, and imagination are all said to begin with a spark. So fasten your seatbelt and take the ride of your life and listen for the spark. Good evening. This is Bill O'Reilly. I'm here with Liz Neuer Feld, and we are listening. Uh, and you are listening to For Immediate Release. It is Monday, September 17, 2018. We're here to talk politics, and we're very grateful that you're joining us again. Liz, how are you tonight? Oh, it's so good to talk to you again, Billy. And hello to everyone out there. Thanks for joining us again. Uh, another long seven days in politics around the country. A lot of primaries we can talk about that happened last week, and. Certainly a lot of news over this weekend with the Kavanaugh nomination now uh, under deep discussion and, and possibly up in the air. It, it, it sure has been an interesting weekend, and 
we're watching and everyone's trying to figure out what's going to happen in, in on November 6th, whether it's going to be that, that, you know, blue wave everyone talks about or some people talk about a red wave. I don't think anybody's talking about a neutral wave. <laughs> Something's going to happen. And uh, we're wondering if there's any, any clues on the road from this week. Well, and especially in these Democratic primaries, uh, there were several last week. Uh, and it's interesting. I don't know if you saw Frank Bruni's column yesterday in the Times. Uh, but he had a couple of great points, including that um, a lot of these victors are under 45 years old. And it's interesting to see how – and they're challengers, but not, not the incumbents. Uh, and that's certainly a theme in the, on the Democrat side. I don't know about in the Republican primaries. I haven't looked that closely. But I, I, I don't know if you were tracking that. Yeah, no, I did, I did see that. I, and I saw another, another article similar to that. I mean, there is definitely a, a revolt going on in the Democratic Party. We've, there's been so much conversation about what's been happening in the Republican Party for the last couple of years. But there's no question about it, especially in urban areas. You're seeing a lot of young, and they're now, you know, calling themselves Democratic Socialists, which is, I mean, unabashedly, which is just, you know, to, to anyone, you know, our age that it just, you know, it, it shrinks. But, but they're doing it, and they're taking down incumbents. In New York, it was, it was extremely interesting where um, you had Cynthia Nixon – um, running as the Democratic Socialist against Andrew Cuomo, who's, who's pretty hard left himself. And um, what was most extraordinary about that is that he won the primary. She got as many votes as he got in, in his primary in, in 2014, but the vote tally was tripled for the Democratic primary, which talks a little bit about, you know, about, you know, motivation probably for November, um, or it could just talk about, you know, how freaked out some voters were by Nixon, or um, you know who knows? We'll, we'll see see what it what it ends up being. Uh, I, I, yeah, and I think that one of the things we did see in that race is that people who who really don't want Andrew Cuomo to be the governor again uh, really just didn't think that she was qualified, that Nixon was qualified enough to do it. The governing the state of New York is not a a, a good first time job for someone in elective office, I and mean, having had no governing experience at all. So I'm not sure she lost on the issues. I'm not sure you could read I think I, to that. And I, I think that's right, Liz. I, yeah, she she said yes to everything. And for, for those um, not who didn't follow the race, um, Cynthia Nixon, of course, is, is played Miranda on Sex and the City, but has been also active politically for many years in New York, um, pushing you know a lot of the you know the, the very very left you know kind of progressive issues. And um, but but she was you know any given speech, and she she you know was spending you know ten fifteen billion dollars at a clip. I mean, it was just yes to everything. And Andrew Cuomo is not, yes. not, not much better. But I think you're right, Liz. I think it freaked out a lot of people. Well, one of the other things we can talk about, and even though uh, we, obviously our, our audience is national, but one of the lessons we can draw from some of the other primaries in New York last week at the, you know, for the state Senate and for the Assembly were that Democratic incumbents lost to those primary challengers because they were accused of being too bipartisan and actually cooperating too much with the Republicans in the state legislature, which is really astounding. And I always I have to laugh, having, having run myself against a longtime Democratic incumbent who voted for uh, with the Republicans 98% of the time during her time in office. When it came time, you know, election time every year, she'd scream about how she, Republicans were awful, but then she'd vote with them. Interesting how this time these Democrats were actually uh, really taken to task for it, and they lost. A number of them lost their seats. And it's a, it's amazing how how much words matter and just the semantics of it. Where you know if you I mean I remember sitting in focus groups a couple of years ago, some very very kind of high end focus groups, and and what everybody who was um, anybody who was available, you know, you have the you have people on the right and left that are that are definitely going to vote for a certain individual, but for the available voters, the the buzzword was bipartisanship, at least on the that was an East Coast thing I think, and it was you know throw it into your ad, get it out there everywhere. But what the what the Democrats did in taking down these you know ostensibly bipartisan Democrats who did work with Republicans was they they just relabeled as selling it out. They sold their souls. They you know they they sold out to Donald Trump and the right wing anti choice anti you know everything Republican you know you know party. They they hit it with that rhetoric and the voters bought it. I mean they bought it. They got you know six out of eight got ousted, which is pretty extraordinary in New York. Well, the timing, you know, I, I can't help but look back. It was two weeks ago that John McCain, you know, died and had his funeral, and there was so much talk at, at every level of government and with, across all media platforms 
about um, the, the, the loss of bipartisanship and that he was always, you know, right up front, whether it was with Ted Kennedy or Harry Reid or Sheldon Whitehouse um, and, and many other big Democrats in the Senate. He worked to get things done. He was very close to Hillary Clinton when she was a sitting senator. And to think that everyone was talking about the good old days of bipartisanship and <laughs> now that McCain's down with them, and it, it was three days later. That it always sounds great outside the funeral, you know? Outside. When you're smoking, when you're smoking a pot outside of the service, it sounds great. You know, we should really all get together yeah. again. We all kind of dial it back. <laughs> it's interesting. You know, the Washington Post had a great piece over the weekend about a, a woman running out in um, in Michigan uh, for Congress. It's her first time running for office. And one of the comments in the story was just that. She said, the voters, they want the anger to stop, but they can't stop being angry. And, and it's, 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 well, that's it's pretty good. exactly something. Isn't that great? It's yeah, that's great. That is very good. Yeah. Oh, oh, before he jumps on, we should mention that we're, we're about to be visited by a, an amazing guest. Um, his name is Rob Astorino. For those who don't, those of you who don't know Rob, and I think you probably do, he's now a CNN contributor, a Republican. Um, Rob was a, a Republican candidate for governor of New York in 2014 who did extraordinarily well against Andrew Cuomo in a race that nobody thought was going to be real. Um, he was also a longtime Kennedy executive in New York, and um, he's now an advisor to Trump 2020, and um, he's, the, um, he's the Republican to torture on CNN every night. And he does a, he does a very he's good right. job, but he's going to be calling in in a second. And uh, Rob also started you know, ESPN Radio in New York. He's a really interesting guy, ran the Catholic Channel well, radio station. Um, and here's a guy who is a very proud conservative who was elected – County executive twice in Westchester County, where the registration Democrat to Republican is almost three to one now. Two to one when he was first elected. Now it's almost three to one. He had a Democratic legislature for a while, and he uh, was enormously successful. First of all, in, in and maybe we should brag about him when he's on the phone with us. Um, but uh, and not only in, in, in delivering on his promise not to raise taxes in the county, which is awfully tough in a state that has got the worst taxes in the country, but. Um, but also sticking true to his principle. And even though he cooperated and worked with everybody, no matter what party or what part of the county they were from, um, I, I have always thought that he, was, he is a great national leader because of the example that he set in tone, and we, and temperament, and style. Absolutely. And will remain one. And for anyone who doesn't know Westchester, it's no, it's no small, small uh, county. It's a million people just north of New York City. It's about two and a half to one to Democrat, uh, Democrat to Republican. Almost, and it's got you know Hillary Clinton, Andrew Cuomo, Bill Clinton, um, most of the kind of Hollywood left celebrities. A lot of them live in, in Westchester County. And Rob came in as a, as a pro-life conservative Republican, unapologetic, Second Amendment, and um, and twice won by um, by 13 point margins. You know, despite having you know three, four, five million dollars spent against him against him. So uh, really pretty extraordinary. You have to you have to be somebody special to, to pull that off in politics these days. But you're right, Liz. He's sincere. And he says what he believes, and people respected him for it. And then, you know, he got taken out in the in the Trump waves in uh, last year. But you know, he's right back out there. He's right back out, and and even more national than ever. You know, and I I guess you know, and he'll have a lot to say about this. But you know, what it was like for him to campaign, uh, where every, no matter what he talked about in the last two months, all he all he was asked to do was to answer for Trump, defend. His, his own allegiance to Trump, our answer for Trump's principles, or answer for Trump's behavior, and clearly this is what's been going on. But uh, I, I think that's when you talk about what might happen in November. It's, a, it's, a, it's irrational how people can't see past that. Voters can't see past it. Right. No, I, I think that's right. I'm just text, sending a quick, quick, uh, quick text message over to Rob. I think he's about to call in. Um, I'm on. But um, oh, there you are. Rob Astorino. Um, <laughs> no, why did I stop you when you were talking so nicely about me? <laughs> have, you been, have you been doing a Tom Sawyer from the, the rafters of your funeral? <laughs> I was just about to get into your SAT scores. How are you, Rob? Uh, I, think, I think Judge Kavanaugh would rather just talk about his SAT scores than what the hell he's uh, dealing with right now. Oh, good Lord. What's going to happen there, Rob? Any, any insight? I, look, this is part of the Democratic plan to run out the clock. All they're trying to do is push it back, wait for October 1st to come and go, which would be the start of the Supreme Court uh, session, and then they would try to make a claim that, well, it, there's no reason to rush it anyway because the courts already started to hear cases, and uh, we've got so much more to dig into on this, 
Meanwhile, this goes back to high school. Um, and, you know, I think what Kellyanne Conway says, all right, everyone deserves to have their voice heard. But I think this needs to be just – justice needs to be served swiftly here and exponentially. You know, we need to know how bad it is if it ever even occurred, and that's the big issue. you got due process, but this is all political. I mean, she, the woman who has stepped forward, and, you know, you have to give her credit for, for coming out of the shadows and, and putting her name out there. But this was going back to July uh, with Senator Feinstein, and – Nobody brought it up at all. The FBI apparently didn't think it was warranted because they kind of poo-pooed it and just sent it as a note to the White House. And now there's there's gaps in her story where she's not even sure when it was or where it was. You know, you can say, all right, I'm not sure exactly when it was, like the, the actual date, but I do know I was here. And, and that's that's a big problem because she's you know Judge Kavanaugh by all accounts is a, is a really good person, and he's being smeared for something that may not have even been him. And and, you know, and, so. and what typically happens when you have a bad guy out there, you have women coming out of the woodwork, which we've seen with a, a lot of with other elected officials. They'll come out of the woodwork and tell their story. But what we're seeing with Kavanaugh is women coming out of the woodwork to say what a wonderful guy he is. That, that That's known right. for years. I mean, he has 65 letters from high school from, from girls he went to high school with saying, uh-uh, wrong guy. Um, so you have, last... look, and, and it, well, this is the whole problem. You know, the Me Too movement is good and bad, just like anything, right? And, and it goes to the extremes where there's a lot of people who get figuratively gunned down in losing their reputation, losing their jobs, um, without even an opportunity to respond because they're guilty in public opinion or people are afraid to speak out. And here, you know, you're going literally going back over 30 years. He's 51, I think, right? So you're going back 33 or 34 years to when this may have happened. It was never brought up at all since then. And, you know, 30 years later, she, she kind of remembers something. But the, the guy who apparently he was with, uh, both of them categorically deny it. And she's not even sure who, who, who it was. So, I mean, th- this is – Unfortunately, this is what's politics now, right? I mean, Liz, is, Liz was in elected office. I was in elected office, and it's just getting so miserable, and it's just destructive now. I, I just – there are so many things about this that, that are appalling to me. I, I think Rob, the giant Feinstein um, piece of it is probably the most appalling. Uh, the idea that any senator sitting on that Judiciary Committee would have had this information for two months where she has had both public and private opportunity to, to interrogate <laughs> Judge Kavanaugh and to bring it to the attention of everyone else on that committee, or even just to go to the press if she wanted to, because that's what these guys do with everything. Now, run right to the CNN right. before you even go to the person you're accusing. But she did nothing about it. Even even Anna Escher didn't do anything about it. She just turned the letter over to Diane Feinstein, and that was that. So there's that whole piece of it. That I, I, I can't believe she, there wasn't more hue and cry about that. Uh, maybe there is behind closed doors on the Hill. I don't know. But, um, Rob, your point about the party is exactly right. There were four people in the room. Now there were two people in the room. She doesn't know what house it was at. Listen, if something happened to her somewhere, which I don't think I – mean, which is entirely possible or likely or right. – I don't think everyone agrees. It, you know, it, it, it's, it's horrible, and she's clearly – Right, it's unacceptable. Right. She, it's, she, she was traumatized by something that she spoke to a therapist about years ago. But beyond that, to do this right now, is there something that smells very wrong, very wrong with the process? Yeah. Well, this so is that last-second bomb. Yep. It's the last-second bomb they throw in there no. to try to stop, and that's the worst thing. And that's, now they're making all the comparisons to Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas and, you know, breaking out the, the, the video of 1991 and um, – you know, and that's it. It's it's unfortunately he said, she said, or two he's versus one she. And, you know, honestly, where is this? It's going to end up with two denials and one, one saying that it happened. And where are we going on this? I mean, we know and, and right Rob, now where it's going to end up. Rob, do you, do you have a sense of, of whether the vote's going to go as scheduled or do you think they're going to successfully delay it? I think there's going to be enormous pressure on both sides. And here's what's going to happen right now. You've got some of the senators who probably would have voted for him, the Democratic side, who now have a fig leaf. And you've got some wishy-washy Republican senators who 
are going to say, look, we've got to look into this to give themselves the, the cover. But really, how long, how long should this take? That she should be immediately summoned to the yes. House Judiciary, uh, Senate Judiciary Committee, uh, do it either in closed session or in public. But it's going to become a circus. But flesh this stuff out, uh, flush it out right now, right now, immediately. Set, a, set an immediate timetable. And that's why we have statute of limitations. That's why there's due process. So these things don't happen or, or shouldn't be able to take someone down. I mean, that, that's why we have the system that we have. I mean, it's a political, obvious, and, and politics doesn't follow the law necessarily. But this is a prime example of somebody getting or an attempted assassination on his character and to, to stop because they, they can't. They can't stop him based on his record, based on his character and integrity thus far. So they're going to throw this in there uh, with the hopes that this uh, gets them across the finish line. And, and across the finish line is, I think, different dates. October 1st, as I mentioned, the election in November. And then, of course, uh, you know, by January 20th when new senators get sworn in. Hey, Rob, I've been told that on very good authority, firsthand authority, that you are, de- de- you are directly responsible for um, President Trump winning the presidency or, or being president of the United States. Can you speak well, to that? I heard the same too. thing. I no, heard no, 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 no. I, I'm talking about, tw- I'm talking about 20, 2014. Can you talk about that? <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we want to hear the story. Can tell everybody the story. <laughs> it's um, true. Yeah, well, I, so I ran for governor in New York in 2014, and – there was a certain businessman out of New York City named Donald J. Trump who was also flirting with running as a Republican in a primary for governor. And I and many mm. others knew he was never going to do that. But, um, you know, for the last 20 years, he's been he's been flirting with running for something, whether it was president or, uh, in this case, governor. And so he kind of announced that he wanted to run. And I was already involved, and I was already active with the campaign and raising money and going around the state and lining up support. And he, um, you know, he met with party leaders. Um, the polling that everyone had, he, he, his polling then was about where it is now in New York. So he wasn't going to go anywhere. But what it did was really just stop the campaign and just froze everything for like two months, which was not helpful and I got a call from a guy named Michael Cohen, and um, <laughs> and of course I spoke to Donald Trump, who I had known for 15 years. So, you know, we we kind of basically agreed that uh, I was not going to get out, and he was going to have to do a primary if that's the way he wanted to go. And eventually, he decided uh, since he didn't have unanimous 100% support <laughs> from all the Republicans. <laughs> that he's going to drop out, and what a shame, because he would have won big with, like, 65%. And he would have won go. huge. He would have won but he huge. Did, yeah. he, did, he, did, he decided to run for president instead. <laughs> you know what? And it worked out for him. It was funny because it worked he out. and I joked about that. We joked about that the night of um, – it was June of 16, and he wrapped up the Republican nomination. He won the California primary that night, and he had his uh, primary night speech – and party at his golf course in Westchester. So I went that night, and when it was over, somebody had come out and said, uh, you know, Mr. Trump saw you out in the audience. He'd like you to come back to the dining room and just say hi. So I went I went back there and was talking to Trump for about 10 minutes, and he started laughing. He goes, you know, um, I guess yeah. I have you to, uh, to thank <laughs> for me being here. Because if you didn't get out of that race, I don't know what I would have done. If you were, if you got out of that race, I don't know what I would have done. <laughs> and I told him, I know what you would have done. You would have figured out a way to weasel out of that because you weren't going to run for governor to begin with. <laughs> and Rob, what, and Rob, what was the motto of your 2014 campaign? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Make let's make New York great again. <laughs> <laughs> fantastic, fantastic. <laughs> oh my god, yeah, what a life, what a world. Rob, yeah, I would love to hear you, – you, we, we were talking before you joined us just of giving um, our listeners a little snapshot of what the voter registration was like in Westchester County, um, which is, is, you know, almost three to one now, Democrats and Republicans. But it was, but it was always – And women – how do you think it feels to be a Republican woman in Westchester? Uh, so, um, um, but, but, you know, there was, you, obviously you were always –
always at a registration disadvantage, but you managed to uh, engage independents, Democrats, Republicans, conservatives across the board for eight, for eight years, really on policy and at the polls. What what changed, do you think, and, and putting Trump aside for a minute, because everyone's so quick to assign every thing that happens to Trump, um, what what changed in the county that you think the rest of the – that might either be a harbinger for things to come around the rest of the country or um, – uh, you know, just as far as angry voters and, and what's on everyone's mind and, and why it's so tough now to get um, to get crossover from for candidates, crossover voters. I still think Republicans can win in Democratic areas. They can win statewide. They can win locally. Uh, but I think two things, when, when you're in a very Democratic stronghold, I think two things have to be in place. One, the political climate has to be favorable. And two, you have to have an issue – that people agree with that's overwhelming. And so what I had in 09 was a political climate that was favorable because Obama was in and the Democrats were running everything. And so there was, um, I guess, anger on the other side and complacency with Democrats. So that was part of it. And then the other part was taxes. And, you know, Westchester is the highest tax county. So that played into the thinking of voters where they really needed a break and some relief. So both of those combined helped me win. In 17, it was kind of the opposite. Taxes were still the issue. Our numbers were still very good in polling, but we, the outside forces of the political climate in a Democratic county like this were just too too strong. And it was the first opportunity people had, voters had, to – run to the polls and scream their displeasure with Donald Trump. Uh, and I think you're going to see that again this year. I think it's going to be really bad for Republicans around the country. I don't see any scenario where Republicans hold the House. I just don't. Because even in normal times when the, the party in power, the president is um, you know, midway through his first term, generally speaking, they'll lose seats just in good times, normal times. These aren't normal times. People are out literally deranged. I mean, they're screaming. They're losing friends. They're defriending people on Facebook because of someone's support for, for the president if they disagree. So it's totally different right now, and the, the anger is a motivating factor. I, I would say fear, but I don't think it's really fear. It's just anger right now with, with a lot of the Democrats. And you saw around the country, too, you know, Democrats in, in sometimes record numbers – are voting in their primaries, which means if they're voting in their primary, I don't see any reason why they wouldn't vote in November. And and so that doesn't bear well for Republicans, although Republicans are, are voting in higher numbers around the country in primaries, too. So they're active, but not as active as Democrats. Yeah, I found that pretty amazing, Rob. And, and you know, I, I work with you on the in the 17 race and the, and the two before that. Was that, and I hope we're not giving away state secrets on polling. We had a wonderful pollster who's the best in the business, uh, Jim McLaughlin of McLaughlin and Associates. And, um, but, but you're, you know, if I recall correctly, your favorables in our internal polling, meaning what do people think about your job performance, were consistently 58, 60%, 62%. And, and yet you still lost. I mean, it was a two and a half to one Democrat. And that's, and that's something I don't think most people would understand that people can, you know, can say, He's done a great job. He kept his promise. He went, you know, seven years without a tax increase. When does that ever happen? Like you really reformed the entire, the entire million person county. And, um, and people loved what you did, but still they wanted to go out there and send a message. And I think that, that certainly speaks to what, what could happen, um, this November. Um, yeah, and and I, I think, think it w- I think it will. What? And, and it wasn't, it wasn't a regular turnout because, we basically got the same amount of votes I had gotten in the previous election. So, like, our voter came out, you know, and it was the surge. It was that Democrat who doesn't vote other than presidential elections that came out. There were 26,000 extra Democrats who voted in my election that never vote before. Uh, you know, just they don't vote in the off years, but but they did in this election. And, it, and interestingly enough, too, it wasn't um, – so-called minorities, it wasn't Hispanic or African-American. Those were pretty steady and normal. It was. You always, won, you always won the Hispanic vote, though. I mean, you speak Spanish well, fluently. You spend a lot of time. You care about the music. <laughs> Gracias, senor. It was the, um, <laughs> it, 
it, it was the it was the so called educated affluent um, areas white that came out in record numbers, and that's what you're seeing around the country too. They're they're I hate to say, it, but they're the angriest right now, and yeah, just have a knee jerk reaction against the president and anything he does or says. Bob, how do you how, go ahead, Liz? Go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was, I, I um, was asking Billy earlier if you saw Frank Bruni's piece yesterday. I don't know if you saw it, Rob, but uh, just that Democrats shouldn't read too much into the primary results as, as being a wave for the progressives. It's just actually more what these candidates have in common, in addition to being young, um, with female, and minority, is that they were really not winning that much on the big issues. They're winning on um, personality and connecting with voters. They're making the case. They're sort of playing the ground game, going door to door, showing up. Um, I don't know if you see that everywhere else or if you think that's just unique to the Democratic primary, but uh, but that doesn't bode well for Republicans either because a lot of the Republicans who are up are, frankly, older white men who um, want to give a prescription. Like, new, they've got policy prescriptions up the wazoo, uh, but right. they're not they're, – they're just not connected. Well, you know, it's, I, I like Frank. I know Frank a long time, and we actually go on CNN together at times. I think he's wrong on this in that it, it doesn't matter. The end result is what matters, and they're winning these races um, with – you know, they're not winning them all, but they are winning these races, and they're dragging the rest of the party with them, and they are scaring the daylights out of those incumbents who feel they've got to start – you know, paying more attention or, or delivering some victories a la, you know, Andrew Cuomo. I mean, there's no question if Cynthia Nixon was, wasn't running against Cuomo, he wouldn't be doing half the things that he did over the last several months. But he did them because she drove him to do it. And, you know, there's a lot to be said for organizing, for going door to door, for that passion. Uh, Joe Crowley, who, you know, lost to the savior now of the Social Democrats, <laughs> Joe Joe Crowley's um, brother and I are friends, and we were talking about the race, and he said, you know, um, we just completely underestimated the turnover in that district, and the district used to be very Irish, and now it's very Hispanic and, um, and African American and just, you know, sort of a melting pot, and none of them knew who he was. You know, they just – she she got out, and she got them to vote. And that – you're going to see a lot of that sprinkled around the country. You're not going to see that in, you know, in Arkansas, but you're going to see that in, in San Francisco and and in New York City and, and some of these very, very hotbed liberal areas. So I think that's going to really put pressure because as they go to Congress or to state capitals – they're going to they're going to be part of the caucus, and in order to get things done, um, they're going to start dragging the rest over to the left. And speaking of liberal, Rod, I I, I got to ask you, it would have been a lot easier for you to become a contributor at Fox News. Yeah, but you you went CNN. What's what's it like? I mean, every every night the the stem winders coming at you, and you know, you know, you and I sometimes disagree on, on this president. But I sit, I sit in your seat when I watch you on CNN in my mind, and I think, oh, God, here it comes. <laughs> but you, you, you managed to keep your cool. How, how do you like it over there? There are some days when I sit there and go, oh, please, God, please don't let CNN call me in tonight. <laughs> when, uh, when he says something really silly. But, you know, look, I'm not, I'm not a sycophant, and I – there are things I have absolutely disagreed with him on, going back to the yep. 16 campaign on his comments about, you know, Mexicans. And uh, I think those kind of things are a turn off. It's not the party that I believe in or the party that we are. And, you know, he just, unfortunately, he never was really involved in politics. He was a showman. So that's what he brings to the table. He's getting things done. That's the interesting thing. And the country is doing much better today than it was, you know, two years ago by by all matrix. But I would say it is very difficult some nights. I'm sort of like, a, well, I'm a Dolphins fan. So it's like being a Dolphins fan <laughs> at, the, 
at MetLife Stadium for the Jets game, which is exactly what I did. I wore my Dolphins shirt at the game, and you know, I had like five. That was torture. Yeah, but I'm so used to it, it doesn't even bother me. That's like what it's like being a yeah. yeah. I, I have to interject and I just have to interject and let listeners know that that Governor Andrew Cuomo in New York ran television ads of of Rob Astorino at at a um, at a Miami Dolphins game in Buffalo for the Bills fans. <laughs> Yeah, and you didn't think? Was, you didn't think? There was a picture of me and my son when he was six, and we were on the field in Miami with our Dolphin shirts on, and it had been published somewhere. And so he got a hold of that, and they actually made a commercial that ran in the Buffalo market and played in stadium at Rich Stadium, and basically said, you know, how can we elect? How can Western New York elect a <laughs> Dolphin fan governor? <laughs> and I dealt with that for three days. That's how that's how vapid the, the media is. Yeah, yeah. The New York press for it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's like Cynthia Nixon and what bagel she chose. <laughs> right. <laughs> hey, Rob, can you well, – while we have you for just a, a few more minutes, can you tell uh, – you were just recently – I know you mentioned Mexico before and you spent a lot of time in Mexico and in, in, in Puebla, I think, in particular. But you were just down in Peru. Could you talk to us about that? I think you went down with, with your son, with Sean. Yeah, the um, he goes to Iona College. Well, not Iona, he goes to Iona Prep, which is next to Iona College in New Rochelle, New York. And the Christian Brothers have a house down in Lima, Peru, and they do once a year a father-son mission trip. So there was six fathers and six sons, and we went down there and we had a chance to, well, the first five days, I guess, really working up in the mountains, um, building little houses for. The dirt poor, and when I say dirt poor, I mean they really walk on dirt floors. They don't have anything. And it was um, a real eye-opener for me, for him, and I think everyone should have this kind of, you know, service give back just to see what it's like. You know, I mean, after five days, we got to leave and then go see Machu Picchu, which is stunning, and then come home to our own houses. But, you know, the poverty of living on top of each other and these literally like 100 square foot, you know, houses with four pieces of wood holding it together and a tin roof. Um, and yet, as crazy as that sounds, they have no money for the next day. They all have iPhones. <laughs> you will figure that out. <laughs> <laughs> now you know and who it, runs the world. And I bet you there's gratitude, too. You know, there's gratitude sometimes. I was going to say, and many of them are deeply uh, faithful of devout. It is. That's the amazing thing was we we would like go in their houses or wherever and they would have a cross on the wall. They would have family photos and you know there's like four kids and and the mother and father literally living on top of each other. I mean it's 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 100 square feet. But, you know figure that out. That's small. And yet they were thankful for what they did have and not not so concerned what they didn't as as strange as that sounds. But they were a happy people, and we had a great time, and, and met some, you know, wonderful people that I'll never forget. And it was it was a great experience. It really was. That's great. And how has your how has your transition been to um, to real life, to life on the outside? I, I I'm sure that there are moments you miss um you miss elective office, but I I have to imagine that you've gotten a, a, a large part of your life back, and you, certainly your family is probably thrilled to have you home for dinner most nights. Or maybe not. It's maybe nice. you're the, yeah. you're the homeless guy. <laughs> so. Well, it's great because I don't have to shave every day now. I don't have to wear my name tag at my house when I walk in. It's, uh, <laughs> it's, a, it's a different world, you know, and it's it really is. You do get your life back. And it's interesting, a different perspective, because I'm watching it from the outside and seeing how crazy it is. It really and truly is. I mean, it's like you can't win anymore as uh, an elected official. It's just – the public is – they expect miracles. They expect everything that they want to be granted. They don't want to pay for it. Um, there's envy. There's greed. I mean, it's just, like, brutal, and yet you've got a job to do, and that's the basics. And we can't even do the basics anymore in this country, you know, like roads and bridges and just balancing a budget. And we can't even do that anymore. So – it's and and beyond as we talked about earlier, it's so hyper partisan now, and and personal and destructive. Are there days and they said yeah, some days, but honestly, not as much as I thought I would. And it's kind of interesting, 
you know, whether it's from the CNN perch or whatever, just watching it from the outside, still having a foot in it, but watching it from the outside. And I just get to sit there and say, you people are freaking crazy. <laughs> right, yeah. right. And, and, Robert, it also seems as though voters almost want their candidates to lie to them, to promise them things that are that are just fantastical, that are not going to happen. Like, you know, I'm going to fix everything tomorrow. It's going to be done. And you see people going for those candidates, and you want to say, you know, first of all, how do you fall for that? But second of all, how do you spew that and make those promises that you know you can't keep? That, that, that's, that's, that's really concerns me. And that's true. That's like the MO now for politicians. Say whatever it is. It doesn't matter. Um, just get past, you know, the finish line, and then you've got two years or four years to deal with it, or, or they'll forget, and they do forget. Uh, the corruption that we see day in and day out, and people like to complain, and yet the opportunity that they have is on election day or in their own party on a primary day. And few people come out to vote, and those that do tend to just go with the same old, same old. And it's, it is very frustrating, but, you know, it's the system that we have. Um, you know, I love to hear all these uh, these Democrats screaming that, Democracy is uh, at stake here, and, and the world is falling mm-hmm. apart, and our country is, you know, uh, we're, we're at fascism right now. It's pretty amazing because every time I challenge them, can you please tell me exact, give me the examples that you need? Because it seems like the courts have stopped Donald Trump many times. Congress has not passed a lot of the things he wanted to do. And so whatever power he had was through executive orders, which is the exact same thing Obama did. Uh, and any president can do within the law. So the system's actually working the way it was supposed to. You're frustrated because your guy, or in this case, your woman didn't win, uh, but your chance is coming up in November and two years from now. So, you know, do the best you can, but respect those who made the made the decision in this country, which is what they don't do. That's right. Hey, Rob, uh, and I know you you got to jump off, but I was just going to ask one last question. Unless, Liz, if you want to jump in. I was just going to say, you know, is there is there a future run in, on the horizon for Rob Astorino? Uh, I honestly don't know. I mean, would I love to at some point? Yeah, but I don't have this game plan in my head. Um, again, I think it gets back to, like I said earlier, the conditions have to be right for a Republican. And, um, you know, of course, they all have that screenshot of CNN with uh, me and the uh, – you know, the words underneath me, friend of Donald Trump for 50 years. Friend of Donald Trump. Trump, Trump no, supporter. No, worse than that, worse than that Trump loyalist. Yeah. <laughs> Shame on you. Uh, I'll cover for you, Rob. <laughs> yeah. So it would really have to depend you on, be, on the issues thinking. that would draw me into a race and what it would be and, and or or not. You know, who knows? Um, Bob, do you, do you have two more minutes. I want to. Do you think that the country has become, or uh, or has been for a while, a, a bunch of single issue voters, or that in, and putting aside the old, you know, adage, you know, it's the economy stupid, or you know, people vote their pocketbooks, but that right now part of this crazy partisanship is uh, are the single issue voter crowd. I think that's some of it. Most but of those voters are angry. It's, they are angry, but so much has changed, too. Social media has been a positive and a negative. I don't know what it, if it's a net positive or net negative, but it's been both. And, you know, the, the media – when Trump says fake news, I know what he means. I, I Look, it's not that the news is being made up, that it, it never happened and they're making it up. It's like the New York Times story the other day. And I read it that morning, and I'm sitting there going, you've got to be kidding me. On Nikki the Haley, Nikki Haley story? When, oh, yeah. God, when they, they positioned right. it with her picture, her in the headline, to make it look like she ordered or the Trump administration ordered these curtains for $52,000. And it right. went until the very end of the story where it said the Obama administration had done this because it's a new residence. It, it, you know, that's, to me, what he means by fake news. It's through the eyes of ideology. The Washington Post writing an editorial – I mean, think about this. An editorial, as, as Hurricane Florence is hitting the Carolinas, an editorial blaming Donald Trump for the hurricane. I mean, seriously. I mean, this is, so this is what he means by fake news. It's the anchor who smirks when reading a story that will 
you know, be very subjective. That is all part of what he means by fake news. Not that it was completely made up. It's how it's positioned or the omission of facts. Those are the kind of things. And that's very, very true, by the way. There's no question about that. Yeah, I think that's a fair analysis, yep. But, Rob, th- thank you so much for joining us. Rob Astorino, I know we, we asked you for 15 minutes, and we, we suckered you in for more. <laughs> so thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Anytime. Love you guys. He gets thank paid you. a lot by <laughs> CNN to do this. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but I get beat up on CNN. You guys are nice. Because Bill is true. We love you. We're going to brag about you before you hang up. <laughs> thank you. Well, we thank you, Rob. To, and, we, and we want you to run again, and we need you to run again, really. You know, I've said Amen. many times privately. You're exactly what this country needs. I'll run when you run, Liz. Oh, uh, I'm a lot older than you. You got a lot. You got a lot. <laughs> I'm running. Yeah, thank you, Rob. <laughs> thank you. Bye. He's such a wonderful guy, isn't he, Liz? He's probably listening now. <laughs> but he is. You know, I don't. I don't know if you remember. Well, I'm sure you remember. But um, when Rob, when he won in such a surprising, um, you know, victory over. Andy Spano, who was the incumbent uh, Democratic uh, kind of executive back in 2009, at, at, at Rob's inauguration, he spoke a good part of his address in Spanish, beautifully. Yeah. And That's perfect he, Spanish, he, yeah. Perfect. But, and he was so eloquent otherwise. And he's got empathy and smarts and street smarts, too. He's got a lot that um, I walked away from that day thinking, this guy's really got a huge future. And I still feel that way about him. Yeah, oh, absolutely, and, he, and he's got a backbone. I mean, he, and he showed that in his policies. You know, when he came in, he said, um, we're not raising taxes, period, ever. And so he brought in you know, groups that were receiving a lot of money and said, the bottom line is we're not going to raise taxes. If you can find a better way to spend money that's advantageous to, your, you know, to spend it more efficiently, tell us. You're welcome, you're welcome here. And he made a lot of, you know, he made a lot of friends that way. Here's a, a very conservative Republican, but um, straight up and but respectful, loves people, is very open to listen to people of, of all different political backgrounds. But at the end of the day, you have to govern and you have to make a government work. And so, you know, let's let's work together to figure out a better way. Um, but I was going to say, he also has backbone. It just, just reminded me, and I'm going to mention it um, because it still bugs me. When, when Rob Astorino ran for governor in 2014, the chairman of the Republican Governors Association was Chris Christie, the governor of New Jersey. And Chris Christie and Andrew Cuomo were in cahoots. They had they shared that bridge that ended up taking Chris Christie down or destroyed his career. Yes. And yep. Chris Christie, as the head of the Republican Governors Association, who went to recruit Rab Astor into the race, then went out there and called it a lost cause, refused to fund it, indeed told funders not to fund it. Don't waste your money giving it to Rab Astorino. At the end of the day, and Cuomo's numbers were like, you know, seventy four percent popularity rating a couple months before uh, Rob jumped in. And Rob ended up winning 46 out of 62 counties in New York. Didn't have the money to, to advertise in New York City, which was the thing that, that beat him. They got 41% of the vote. And um, I don't know what would have happened with Chris Christie's help, but that's on that's on him for the rest of, of his life, as far as I'm concerned, that the head of the Republican Governor Association sold out the Republican candidate for governor in New York. And uh, that's a black mark on his life for as long as he goes in my book. Well, and he thought uh, he thought he was going further than he than he's gone. That's for sure. And I don't know that's what he ever said he was going to get out of being friendly with Andrew Cuomo because Cuomo wasn't going to do anything for for him. And in fact, he didn't do anything for Chris Christie. So um, no, that was awful. I, I remember that uh, in real time, and uh, it's, inex- it's inexcusable. Plus, as you said, it, 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 one thing is he was just the neighboring Republican governor who was you know, trying to get Rob, and he was the head of the RGA. So no, that's right. That and, if, and in fact, when Christie shut down that bridge and, and all the, and all that happened. Um, if I think probably people will, most will remember the scandal. He shut down the George Washington Bridge or lanes of it to punish a local Democratic mayor for not endorsing him for re-election. And it was bad. There was a woman who, who died trying to get to the hospital. And it was bad. And, um, of course, he denied the whole thing. But, you know, Rob, I remember, as county executive, didn't turn down any interviews. He went out there and defended Christie day after day after day. And he went out there and he complimented on how he handled the scandal and all the rest of it. And that's the kind of thing that 98% of elected officials will duck. They, they do not go out there when you're taking, and Rob was there and backed him up. And then, uh, you know, a few months later, Christie did that. To Rob's credit, to talk about the back point, backbone part, was when Christie did that, Rob, uh, we were doing a news conference in the city, and um, he heard about it, and he walked right up to the microphone and called on Chris Christie to resign as head of the RGA chair, you know, chairmanship. And it was, uh, you know, 
it takes guts. It takes guts. He took him on, and um, at the end of the day, at the end of the day, I think he came out of it a lot better than Chris, Chris Christie did. Oh, we sure he did. He, uh, he well certainly he came out with his integrity intact. That's that's what you can say for sure. Um, yeah. Tony, what do you think about um, uh, Obama getting involved over the last couple of weeks more aggressively? And clearly, he's going to be campaigning between now and the midterms for, uh, for candidates uh, everywhere. But being so vocal about Trump. Uh, it, and, and some revisionist history here on, on the economy, among other things, but uh, well, we haven't even talked about about that. It's a, it's a great question. I, I think it's a bad mistake. I think Democrats are coming out already. I mean, there's evidence of that in, in almost every race we've seen around the country where there's large pockets of Democrats. I mean, they are coming out. And um, all uh, P- President Obama is doing is ensuring that Republicans come out, too. I think it's a major mistake. I, I think it's... Um, it's, you know, that base is fired up. It doesn't have to be fired up again. But when you put Barack Obama on television or Nancy Pelosi, for that matter, and I would put Obama at a higher stature than Nancy Pelosi, all you're doing is irritating Republicans that forgot why they voted for Donald Trump in the first place. And, um, and you know, I, I think it's a mistake. What, what's your take, Liz? Do you think it's smart? No, I agree with you completely. I also think it's interesting. I, I understand that he's still appealing. And, and there's something about him that uh, – uh, I, I, he will always be very well, um, well, received. Written, yeah. like, isn't even the right word. Right, exactly. But you know what? There's one thing that, you know, the Democrats were so angry with him when Hillary was running because they said that, you know, Obama had basically taken care of himself and not built the infrastructure for the party at the grassroots level. He, Obama was elected because he was Obama. And uh, that, you know, Hil- well, Hillary herself said a number of times, um, I inherited nothing but debt, no data, you know, no infrastructure. So I don't know why these candidates now, especially these younger candidates, um, would would welcome sort of the Obama, other than he can obviously raise a lot of money for them. But I think the messaging is wrong. I think you're absolutely right. And it's just going to get a lot of, particularly older Republicans, out to vote, for sure. I, 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 yeah, I, no. I completely agree. They yeah, no. I, privately. I, Do the closed-door stuff, but I wouldn't have them out doing big public events. No. No, I think that's right. I mean, right, do the closed door stuff to raise money. He certainly, he's more popular than ever, even though, you know, he's more popular than when he was president. You know, go in there and, and, um, and raise the money for, for your candidates if that's what you want to do. But I'm not sure going out there in, in public is a great idea. We'll, we'll find out. We'll find out. Liz, what do you, what do you yeah. think? We, I guess we've got, um, we've got about three or four minutes left. Um, what do you think, um, is going to happen with Republican turnout? This year in, in the midterms, we're 50 days away today, and um, and you know, do you, do you expect a good turnout, or do you think there's going to be some depressed turnout? I think uh, I don't. I'll tell you, what, I think what happens with Kavanaugh can make a huge difference. If this gets dragged out, I think the Republicans are going to come out in huge force because we're if, if somehow this gets derailed. I think um, it is going to backfire on the Democrats politically. We'll put aside the merits of what's going on with, um, you know, with, with the accuser, and I guess they'll, you know, she'll have her day, in, her day in public court, and so will he again. But uh, I, I think uh, big that could have, have a big influence on the turnout for sure. What I guess what bothers me is that there are not too many identifiable Republican leaders who can help drive turnout. So I, it's almost an every man for himself. I, I don't think. Trump's going to translate to anything positive for, for, for candidates there. Um, I, he, he certainly helped Republicans in some of these primaries he picked winners, but I, I don't know in the general. Uh, these senators, I mean, Ted Cruz is in big trouble. I mean, there are a couple of these races here, and I don't, I don't know who's going to save them other than you know, maybe they can save themselves. But uh, I, I, I do think it's a problem that people have – and you just heard it from Rob directly. I, mean, this, I don't know anyone who thinks that the Republicans are going to keep the House. So once people or voters are resigned to the fact that they're going to lose something, I mean, if that, if that suppresses turnout or depresses turnout for the Senate candidates, it could be a big problem for Republicans. Yeah, I mean, you, you have I, to tell you there's no question. There's no question the Democrats are motivated to win. No. Yeah, no, and, oh, no, no question. And, and, and it was like the Republicans in, in 2010 that came out. Um, I mean, the Republicans had, had been beaten down and, and lost the – Lost a couple of elections in 2010. The Republicans came out in force, and yeah, these things work in cycles, certainly. But um, I, I think that's I think that's right, and I think one problem for the Republicans and, and every Republican candidate should be terrified of this and needs to address it now. I mean, you got 50 days to go. Is the Republicans that are not inclined to come out because they don't like the president, and depending on what part of the country you're in, that's anywhere from 15 percent to you know 30 percent in some areas. 
um, where you're not inclined to vote, and Republicans have to find a reason to do that. I think I think you're right. I think the Kavanaugh thing could do that unless it's Republicans or the perception is that Republicans blew it. Like if if Susan Collins, you know, um, uh-huh. you know, breaks or, or a couple other Republicans break, um, and 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 this gets shelled, and it looks like like they just abandoned Kavanaugh. I think that could exacerbate the Republican turnout problem. If it's if it's a pin solely on the Democrats and on Feinstein and, and the rest of it, then I think you're right. Then I think it could be a motivator. Um, I think we'll have to see, you know, what what the walkaway is, what the takeaway. But the Republicans um, who are not typically great messengers um, out of Washington need to message this really right if it doesn't turn out well for Kavanaugh. I think the Republic – it's interesting, obviously, all the conversation is about the Democrats, you know, the progressive versus the more moderate supporter in the Democratic Party. But I think we're back to that with the Republicans in Spain. It's really um, – you've got Susan Collins, who consistently votes against the Republican Party. <laughs> you had a number of uh, very unreliable Republican senators in the U.S. Senate. If you just yeah, have the old, up party stuff. The old low liker so, syndrome, right? <laughs> yeah. And, yeah, and you guys. Uh, Arlen Specter, yeah. You know. Yeah, so uh, this is what's going to really hurt the party as much as the Democrats. It's these Republicans who are not, uh, who are not going to drive Republican turnout. They're, yeah, that's right. Right. So I think you, you got you got that big problem. Yeah, we'll see. I, I think we're out of time, but we'll we'll we'll, we'll be back at it next week, and uh, we'll find out soon enough. It's uh, fifty and counting. We'll we'll be there soon. Yeah. Yeah, well, we'll certainly know what's happening with Kavanaugh by next week. And if we don't, that's right. I mean, it's a really big problem for the Republicans. <laughs> that's, that's right. Uh, well, <laughs> well, th- well, thank you, everybody, for listening. Yeah, yeah go ahead, Liz. Talk to all this. Nope, I was just saying thanks again to Rob Estorino. It was great to have him on. Great. Thank you, and, and good night, everybody. Thank you so, for listening in. Take care. Bye-bye.